dear friends today we will talk about the special senses the nervous system works through and gets the messages through the external senses and internal senses the afferent neurons give input to the brain and spinal cord and then the output via motor efferent neurons the somatic nose will give output to the skeletal muscle and autonomic nervous system sympathetic and parasympathetic will give message to the cardiac muscle smooth muscle and glands thus according to the sensory stimuli the body will work and have a motor activity like skeletal muscle running or the increased cardiac activity or increased perspiration the sensory receptors detect specific type of stimuli Exter exterior receptors detect stimuli outside the body and interior receptor detect the stimuli within the body in the visceral they are present the special receptors like for vision for hearing for smell taste and touch again these are the types of the exteroceptors like vision photoreceptors chemoreceptors mechanoreceptors then noise receptors then thermoreceptors then there is a light and chemical pressure movement pain temperature information giving receptors taste receptors and there are sensory organ receptors for taste and touch through eyes tongue skin sensory reception in that there is a detection of energy of a stimulus by sensory cells sensory receptors they are the specialized neurons or epithelial cells within the sensory organ like in the eye in the nose in the ear in the tongue or the fifth one is a somatic sense that is a touch so there will be five senses four special senses like vision by eyes hearing by ears smell by nose taste by tongue and the somatic senses touch by skin so today we will talk about the eye and we will talk about the anatomy of the eye first there are the eyeballs which are situated in the orbital cavity each eyeball is 2.5 cm in diameter it is also supported by other structures like voluntary muscles fat and connective tissue and another is a lacrimal gland the voluntary muscles they are concerned with the movement of the eyeball the lacrimal gland secretes the tears the tears there are the disinfectant like lysozyme and they also indicate the emotions blinking of the eyelids will move these tears move the liquid all over the eyeball and thus they also help in lubrication now about the eyeball there is a outer coat there is a middle coat and there is a inner coat there are three coats the outer coat consists of sclera and cornea then there is a middle coat 
which is made up of choroid, which is of dense vascular network, and this acts like a black cover over the camera and do not allow any extra light towards the eyeball. The innermost layer is of retina. The structures are like iris. It regulates the amount of light entering through the pupil. So these are the iris muscles. The aperture is known as pupil. Behind that there is a cornea and lens. The cornea is a, uh, behind that there is a lens. The cornea is outermost and cornea is transparent but it is having a largest body of the nerve bundles and it is extremely sensitive to pain. There is no blood supply. It is supplied by the aqueous humor present in the anterior chamber behind the cornea, between the cornea and the lens. So, in the anterior chamber there is an aqueous humor and in the posterior chamber there is a vitreous humor. Iris muscles are also attached to the ciliary body and then they are also ciliary body is also attached with the serial ciliary muscles. Iris muscles actually we can say that there are two types of iris muscles constrictor pupil and dilator pupil. So iris is only iris muscle is only related with the pupil and causes the constriction as well as the constriction as well as the dilatation of the pupil. Now we will talk about the ciliary body. The ciliary body is having ciliary muscles and the ciliary muscles are attached to the lens. And they are related with the bulging or the flattening of the lens and they help in the accommodation. The aqueous humor is drained back by the canal of sclam which is present at the corner of the anterior chamber. If this fluid increases then it will increase the pressure in the eyeball leading to the applied physiology glaucoma. It also supplies the nutrients for the cornea, supplies the glucose also. Glucose is more in aqueous humor. This cornea, aqueous humor, lens as well as vitreous humor combinedly form a one refractive medium. The crystalline lens is made up of the flat concentric ribbon like cells it provides the light from the exterior towards the back side of the eyeball the last is a retina In the retina, there is a one terminology is fovea centralis. It is a central of the visual field. It is also the shortest distance where the light travels to reach the retina. Here there is a 
best visual acuity vision is best here optic now the neurons aggregate and come out of the eyeball as a optic nerve where they come out as a, from the eyeball is also known as a optic disc and this optic nerve carry the visual stimuli up to the brain now we will first talk about the image formation and the refraction when the light rays passes from the one medium to the another they do the refraction suppose we assume the refractive index of air as 1 the refractive index of cornea and aqueous humor and vitreous humor is around 1.33 and the refractive index of the lens is 1.4 when light rays from the distant object via cornea enters through the lens they refract and ultimately they pass through the lens and vitreous humor and then they fall in front of the retina fall over the retina here the image which is formed that is upside down but in the brain again it is interpreted as upright the power of the eyeball normal eyeball is considered in diopter here the one diopter is equal to 1 upon focal length of the lens here we consider the focal length of the lens about one point seven so that this is derived from the listings reduced eye model and so that the power of the lens or overall refraction is one diopter is equal to one upon focal length of the lens so that will come 59 diopter for the distant object the parallel rays from the distant object fall through the cornea and lens and they converge and form the image but for the nearer object actually the rays diverge and may fall behind or may not converge at all so that for that the lens has to be stretched in normal eye the ciliary muscles pull the lens and so that these divergent rays can be converged this is called accommodation so normally we have a good accommodation and the normal eye is known as emetropic eye but many a times there are the errors in the refraction the common eye defects are often called refractive errors and they can be corrected by simple compensating lens so the first error of refraction is the myopia the as the spelling suggest it is a short sightedness so patient is able to see the nearer vision properly but cannot see the distant vision properly 
because the eyeball is long and the rays parallel rays coming from the distant area fall in front of retina they do not fall over the retina so here we can use the biconcave lens and thus there is a these parallel rays can be further diverged and again instead of in front of retina they will fall over the retina thus the myopia can be corrected in the hypermetropia or hypermetropic or hyperopic eye there is as the spelling suggest it is a long sightedness the person can see the distant vision properly but cannot see the nearer vision properly because the eyeball is short the rays from the nearer object fall behind the retina so the image will be blurred here these rays should be converged shortened and should fall over the retina so thus the hypermetropia or hyperopia can be corrected by using the biconvex lens thus the rays from the nearer object will fall by using the biconvex lens over exactly over the retina and the error of refraction can be corrected there are some other errors of refraction also like astigmatism where the curvature of the cornea is unequal and another is presbyopia where after 40 or 42 the flexibility of the lens is reduced and the accommodation is not proper here the nearer vision is affected and the person will have a reading glasses overall applied physiology of these eyeball and lens is glaucoma increased pressure over the anterior part of the eyeball and the lens cataract where the crystalline lens it now becomes deposited with the opacities now we are moving towards the retina retina the image of the object falls on the retina which stimulates the end organs of vision or senses sensory receptors which are known as rods and cones and these converts the light signal into the electrical signals that is transmitted through the optic nerve towards the occipital lobe of brain visual cortex actually we can say that there are 7 to 9 layers of retina like pigment layer layer of rods and cones external limiting membrane external nuclear layer plexiform layer inner nuclear layer inner plexiform layer layer of ganglionic cells and layer of optic nerve fibers now about the rods and cones the rods are about 125 million they are also known as light sensitive receptors or light receptors because they can function in very less light also and they are responsible for the night vision 
they are not able to distinguish the color they detect only black and white shades of gray and so that the night vision is always in black and white the rod cells are absent in fovea centralis center of the visual field but they are present in periphery periphery of the retina so that they are related with the peripheral vision and thus we can say that the dim star can be better seen by looking at that from the angle not directly the cone cells are about 6 million their function is better in bright light they require more light to stimulate they distinguish colors in daylight they are highest density at the fovea that is center they contain less than 1% of the retinal site but it takes up over 50% of the visual cortex in the brain so in daylight we have a sharpest vision the photoreceptors either rods or cones they work through the chemicals like photopsin there is a opsin in that opsin is a membrane protein on the disc of photoreceptors and they combine with retinal this is a light absorbing pigment derived from the vitamin a here we can see the one rod there is a inner segment and outer segment inner segment contains of cell body and having synaptic terminal the outer segment have disc the disc are continuously rotating and they receive the light ray and there is a conversion of the vitamin a or retinal into the rhodopsin so thus the disc are rotating and there is a formation of the rhodopsin the rhodopsin is a material formed by the opsin and retinal in rod cells in cones it is known as photopsin the photopsin which is formed by the cones but here we can say that there is a three types according to the primary colors of the light the cones are different one is a s cones they are stimulated by short wavelength or blue color sensitive cones they identify the blue color there is also m cones medium wavelength and they identify the green color or they are known as green cones and there is also l cone which identify the long wavelength they are known as red cones so thus the wavelength between the 400 to 700 is identified by blue green and red cones thus it forms the color vision when the light ray from the 7 720 to 650 nanometer length is there they sensitize the red cones 575 to 490 nanometer sensitize the green cone 
and the light ray of about 490 to 450 nanometer sensitize the blue cone and thus there is a formation of a colored vision. The white light ray consists of all colors and thus there is a detection of a blue, green or red cones or the mixture of the colors and mixture of the light rays will give other colors. Absence of the color is black color. Absence of the light is black color. This theory is proposed by two scientists, Young and Hamhaus theory about the color vision. Color blindness occurs due to the absence of the either cone, either blue sensitive or green sensitive or red sensitive. It is a sex link genetic disorder. Deficiency or absence of one or more types of cones. Now we are moving towards the dark adaptation and light adaptation. In the light or daylight, the light bleaches the rhodopsin, light changes the shape of retinal and detaching it from the rhodopsin, the rod cells are unresponsive. But the cones take over. Cones are sensitized by smallest amount of the light ray. In the daylight, cones are sensitive. But when person comes from the dark room towards the bright light there is a constriction of pupil so that minimum amount of the light ray enters up to the cones and the person may not be disturbed by the bright light but the cones are stimulated and person is able to see but due to the constriction of the pupil minimum amount of the light rays will reach up to the retina no damage to the retina. This is known as light adaptation. In dark, there is a dilatation of pupil. As we know that the retina contains rods in the periphery more. And thus, in the dark, the rhodopsin is more formed. The smallest light ray from the corners of the objects in the night emitted are passed through the dilated pupil up to the periphery of the retina and the rods are sensitized and form the rhodopsin. Thus the rods are responsible for the night vision as well as peripheral vision and they are associated with the dark adaptation. In the absence of vitamin A or retinal, the rhodopsin is less formed and person is not able to see in the dark. This is known as night blindness due to the vitamin A deficiency. Now, we are moving towards the optic nerve. The light stimuli which is transmitted by the rod or cone cells, it is transmitted through the optic nerve to the occipital lobe of brain. But there is a certain pathway. The sensory reception is known as vision. Here there are the different parts. One is a sensory transmutation which is done by the rods and cones. The amplification which is done by rods and cones. And the transmission of the action potential via optic nerve which is via optic pathway 
visual pathway reach up to the occipital lobe where there is a integration so this is the optic nerve and visual pathway or optic track also the optic nerve is formed by the axons of ganglionic cells optic nerve leaves eye through the optic disc the fiber from the temporal part of retina are in a lateral part of the nerve and carry the impulses from the nasal half and the fibers from the nasal part carry the impulses they are in the medial part of the nerve and carry the impulses from the temporal part of the visual field of the same side the first of all we will talk about the optic chiasma after the optic nerve the medial fibers of each optic nerve cross the midline medial fibers cross the midline and join the uncrossed lateral fibers uncrossed lateral fibers to form the optic trail thus the optic track is formed by uncrossed fibers of the optic nerve of the same side and the crossed fibers of the optic nerve of the opposite side they curve around the cerebral peduncle they also curve around the lateral geniculate body and we can say they form ultimately the optic radiation in between they give fiber to the superior colliculus as well as pretectal nucleus and the supra optic nucleus of the hypothalamus to the hypothalamus for the regulation of circadian rhythm for to the pretectum for the reflex pupillary control or pupillary reflex and to the superior colliculus for the orientation of the movements of head and eye the visual cortex or primary visual cortex the fibers from the lateral geniculate body pass through the internal capsule and form the optic radiation the fibers between the lateral geniculate body and visual cortex are also called the geniculocalcarine fibers because the visual cortex is situated in the medial surface of the occipital lobe which is also known as inner side of the calcarine fissure the areas of the visual cortex the primary visual area is area number 17 which is concerned with the perception of the visual impulses the secondary area area number 18 which is concerned with the interpretation of the visual impulses occipital eye field which is concerned with the movements of the eye area number 19 in the applied physiology if there is a lesion to the particular optic nerve the total blindness of that eye will be there here there is a lesion of the left optic nerve and total blindness of the left eye
when there is a lesion to the lateral fibers of left side of the optic chiasma there is a left nasal hemianopia the lesion of the optic chiasma leads to the lesion of the medial fibers of the optic chiasma and there is a bitemporal hemianopia the lesion of the left optic radiation there is a right side homonymous hemianopia and the lesion of the right optic radiation left side homonymous hemianopia so this is again the another picture due to the various lesions either there is a complete loss or the person is not able to see the one half either half in the vision or the person is not able to see the medial side or the lateral side thank you dear students